Frank when, when you're around. <laughs> and I want to say before I begin, thank you very much, Honorable Walter Schwartz, Sarah, thank you, the Dobbs Ferry Library, thank you very much. I have to admit, um, I was chuckling to myself that after Walter's wonderful speech that I, I sort of felt like uh, the meeting many, many, many years ago of Edward Everett and Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg, um, where Edward Everett spent two hours orating, um, Lincoln spent 10 minutes orating, and who do we remember the most? Uh, I'm certainly not in any way suggesting that what I have here to say today is going to be uh, so awe-inspiring after this wonderful speech by Walter. Um, but I am honored, and I was honored, to be asked uh, as the great-grandson to be a part of this lecture of Colonel Brown, about Colonel Brown and Ida. Um, my input as a family member, and I'm one of many, there are many family members, um, probably the grandchildren, uh, who I will mention, um, my uncle, uh, who is in Naples, um, are, are in their 80s and 90s at this point in time. Uh, the great-grandchildren are probably in the vicinity of my age, which is perpetual 29. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, enough um, that Ida, and I will start by saying, and her talents uh, as a wife and as a mother go uh, far beyond uh, what she did for Colonel Brown for the family. Um, she also was a painter. And just quickly, um, if you take a moment to look at this uh, painting that we have of the horses, um, was done by Ida when she was 26 years old uh, in 1890, three years before her marriage to the Colonel. Uh, it's a beautiful painting, so not only um, do we segue a little bit into what all of us have been talking about Ida, but there's another, um, another part of Ida's great legacy. Um, Colonel Brown began his business um, and his career with, as Walter had said, Candler and Company of Boston. Um, they were interested in the India trade and Florida railroads. The Colonel graduated from high school in Melrose, Mass, and Ida lived at Beacon Street in Boston, uh, the building that housed her family bought by her father and mother still stands on Beacon Street, 197 to 199, which can be looked up um, on the internet. Um, how and where Ida met, I personally don't know, um, but I know that we are here today talking about the Colonel because of their meeting, uh, because of, of who, and I am here really because of that meeting. Um, I'm sure that um, there were many times in the family though, I can't say that, especially mothers that may have perhaps wished I was not there and somewhere else. Um, but those are stories for another day. So it began, a family, a career, a way of life. The Colonel's longevity gave me the sincere privilege to have been born during the last year of his life. I was born in January 1955. He passed away in November of 1955. Um, at the very least, uh, as a great-grandson, I, I would have hoped that perhaps he had gazed upon me, um, that sincere and generous man. If not, it held me affectionately, maybe once or twice, and wondered to himself, what lay ahead for this little person. Yet as lucky as I may have been in 1955, I will say that anecdotal family stories did not always revolve around the Colonel and Ida as I grew up, as new generations were taking up the causes of the times and relating stories of the events of World War II and beyond. Family stories of Ida and Franklin were relegated in my generation's case to our grandparents' telling, and I would see my grandparents periodically. As much as I was aware of Franklin and Ida's existence, and I will add knowingly that they're affectionately referred to by their grandchildren as Grandmere and Grandpere, I was not always privy to a large cache of family anecdotes. 
so it was in later years with my insatiable desire for family history that I embarked on my journey with the Colonel and Ida, learning more about their accomplishments, but certainly building a sense of the family part of their lives and the motivations behind their union. On 29 July 1862, it was a special day for my family as well as the citizens of Dobbs Ferry in the future as it was to witness the birth of a son, a father, a businessman, and philanthropist into an unbridled time. And referring to Abraham Lincoln uh, again, it was testing, paraphrased as whether this nation can long endure. But endure it did, and so did the Colonel, and so did Ida. Born in Chicago and spending the high school years in Melrose, Mass., perhaps his earliest, most fervent memories had been the reconstruction years after the Civil War. Perhaps as he saw it, uh, there was an unconscious disdain for the horrible sufferings of its veterans, the sufferings of the citizens of both the North and the South, and of its youngest victims, the children. All that may have influenced his character and his desire for kindness, virtue, and morality, a character trait that would shape not only his younger years as a railroad executive, but later financial and philanthropic endeavors as benefactor, greeter of presidents, and beloved citizen of Dobbs Ferry. This concept as well, not lost to Ida Brown, as the Yonkers statesman on September 13th, 1950, shortly after her passing, said, quote, Lady Bountiful of Dobbs Ferry is dead. Mrs. Franklin Q. Brown, a distinguished woman of vivid personality and vast love for underprivileged men and women with a unique zest and with richness of heart and mind, she filled her years with lighting candles of joy and opportunity. A story I recall retold many years after his death as St. Paul admonishes the Christian to make use of life's sustenance and to and for the glory of God to which he might have found in the forefront of Colonel's thoughts perhaps was that quote, it seems to me that the use of money can be a large part of Christian stewardship. It can be a means whereby the poor are clothed and fed, the sick are healed, the lonely are comforted, the elderly are visited, our young are guided in the correct channels and the needs of our neighbors are met, unquote. And so it seems that the Colonel and Ida's philanthropic endeavors in their beloved Dobbs Ferry carry this message unambiguously. From their unassuming beginnings and to their more than 50 year marriage, which must have been a lovely affair and was attended by siblings and cousins alike, all culminating in a lavish recep reception at the Eldridge res residence on Beacon Street in Boston. From that wedding day grew a family of five including my grandmother, Sylvia Eldridge Brown. There's a picture of her up there, who was born in 1898. While the Colonel was tending to his duties in Tampa as one of Mr. Henry Plant's railroad company's, quote, lieutenants. Ida, in the meantime, doing her duty as a mother, wife, and business partner, was in Dobbs Ferry looking for a place to live. So when the Colonel returned from Florida, they could resume their life together. Springhurst thus became the rallying point of the family for more than 50 years. It was the likes of my aunts, of my uncles, great aunts, great uncles, and the famous and not so famous, and I hesitate to use the word infamous, <laughs> as well as the beloved fauna of the family of sheep, horses, dogs, and cats. It was in 1926 to his daughter, Sylvia Eldridge Brown, uh, who gave birth to a daughter, my mother, Sylvia Wells Morse. Later, writing to his daughter, Sylvia, this was Franklin, and his new granddaughter, also Sylvia, he penned this little ditty. Ironically, I might add, upon the very stationery, as Walter had mentioned, of his former employer and friendly rival, Mr. Henry Flagler. Quote, if Sylvia should, on due reflection, say to daughter just arrived, it is evident that your complexion indicates the Norse strain has
can't survive. <laughs> Daughter might reply and say, I really think without contention, old saga reading grandpa may regard with favor any rose you mention. But this I must and do declare, that whether Saxon, French, or Norse, my porringer shall always bear euphonious names to precede Morse. <laughs> In 1955, as I arrived in this world, Colonel Franklin Quimby Brown, or the Colonel, did not have much longer. Preceded by Ida in 1950, I'm sure those final years were the saddest years of his life. He had, by the age of 93, accomplished many more things than any of us would ever have hoped to accomplish in our lifetime. Progenitor of successful lineage, financier, philanthropist, businessman, railroad executive, among other titles. Colonel Brown seems to have done it all. I speak often to my Uncle Brud, or Charles A. Morris, Jr., a grandson to the Colonel. He fills in some of the blanks when I ask about the man I call my great-grandfather. He holds back nothing, but says only he was a tough man. I smile, I know what he means. No one leaves a legacy like the Colonel unless you were tough. No one grows up to be as successful in the era he was born unless you were tough. However, toughness is not all that his loving father, that this loving father, grandfather, and great grandfather left behind. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's all around you every day. If he is listening, and I'm sure he is, thank you, Colonel, from your family your associates, and those who honor you to this day. When it comes to my great-grandfather, Colonel Brown, and my great-grandmother, Ida, we now look at what they did in life and to their legacy and death in that sense. I think Ross Perot could not have said it better. Quote, action is greater than writing. A good man is a nobler object of contemplation than a great author. There are but two things worth living for, to do what is worthy of being written and to write what is worthy of being read. Rest in peace, dear great-grandparents. You are respected, honored, and loved here today more than you will ever know. Thank you.